Thank you to folks who are joining. Uh, we will get, we'll be getting started shortly, uh, wanting to, uh, you know, give folks some time to join. Uh, but while you wait, if you don't mind, maybe dropping in your name and uh, organization or where you're in, where you're joining us from the state uh, here in California. Thank you. Great seeing folks, uh, a lot of folks here, representation from the Central Valley. So thank you all and our partners from Leadership Council. Um, yep, yeah, thank you. So you got some folks from Santa Ana, uh, Kern County, Merced, here in LA, Riverside. <laughs> Hi, Mike, thank you for joining. Uh, always uh, there to support ECI. Uh, for folks that you know may know may not know, Mike uh, Russo used to be the director of the Equity and Community Investments team. Thank you for joining. Good morning, Rachel. Nice. Hi, Patti. Great to see you. This is awesome. A lot of great partners. Hi, Jen um, from Long Beach. So thank you all for joining us. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, Thank you, Asad, for, for starting the recording. Um, so again, uh, you know, want to thank folks for, for joining us uh, Thursday. Uh, you know, I know this, uh, you know, we, we kind of put this together in a really quick fashion, um, mostly because we wanted to make sure that um, a lot of the folks doing the organizing work on the ground um, were aware, at least initially, of some of the initial research that we've been able to pull out in terms of how local governments have been spending their CARES Act funding. Some of this information may come in handy, in particular, as folks are still doing advocacy work around these funds. Uh, so we wanted to make sure to get it out there uh, as soon as possible. Um, so if, Sada, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So for those of you who may not know us um, or me, my name is Jackie Guerrero. I'm the Associate Director of the Equity and Community Investments Team. Uh, with the Advancement Project California. Uh, we're a multiracial civil rights organization. Um, and, you know, we work not just here in Los Angeles uh, and or Sacramento, which we do a lot of statewide policy work as well, but we're really located uh, across the state in various, uh, you know, jurisdictions through the Central Valley, the Inland Empire, and then Southern California region. Um, and so as an organization, we have three main um, you know, programs uh, that you may interact with. So if you ever work with someone from the Advancer Project, they may come from one of these programs. We have folks that do great educational policy work at the statewide level, also locally. Of course, there's the team, uh, Equity and Community Investments that I lead. And a lot of the work we do is really supporting community-based organizations in their efforts to win more policy and budget uh, campaigns uh, and investments really uh, towards, for equity in, uh, you know, communities of color, uh, in, in trying to support those efforts. Then our political voice team there, um, you know, who really focus on making uh, participatory, our governments more participatory and representative of communities. And so you may have interacted with them through some of our census or redistricting work. Um, and that we also wanted to, you know, uh, highlight that they, at the end of the webinar that they put out a great report recently on participatory budgeting. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, and so the presenters for today, uh, you, you're hearing from me, Jackie, uh, but we also got uh, Asad Beg and Anisha who are on our team. Um, you know, they are really some of the, the greatest folks to work with uh, who support a lot of the, you know, Anisha, the built environment work here in LA and Asad doing a lot of youth development work and justice reinvestment work here in LA County as well as in other areas of the state. Um, so you'll be hearing from us uh, as we kind of walk you through the different uh, sections of the presentation. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, 
So before I get into the goals, I think that the real impetus as to why we're doing this is, um, you know, as many of you all have interacted with us uh, throughout the year, <clears throat> you know, we, you know, this, the, there was a lot of um, obviously focus and, and emphasis on trying to figure out what was CARES Act, what, what it did and how it was there really to support communities as we all were dealing with this really horrible pandemic. Um, you know, it's, it's, it goes without saying, but it's really important to lift up that, you know, the, the COVID pandemic was unexpected. Um, it really has impacted uh, black and brown communities, indigenous communities, API communities. Um, and, you know, for these folks who already were, were dealing with, um, you know, economic uncertainties and health, uh, lack of health care and health access, having a pandemic hit was, was really the last thing that, that, that has really put a strain um, on these families. And the strain has come in all forms, whether it's uh, around housing and ensuring and being able to stay in housing, it's food scarcity, and then, of course, there's a health uh, access and needing for resources there. Um, and then, again, putting pressure on education systems to be able to provide those services for students. Um, so all of this was really unexpected. Um, then, you know, of course, there was the federal relief package through CARES that happened earlier in the year. And for at least some of us, this was really a first time experience and event. Um, we, there was billions of dollars then being funneled down to localities, uh, really with, with almost, uh, you know, it seemed like a lot of flexibility in terms of how it could be used for providing immediate supports and needs for communities. Um, all of that, of course, was happening at a time when then the economic recession was moving because of COVID. And then, um, of course, you know, important uh, issues coming up to the forefront again around the, the movement for Black lives and then needing to really relook at um, our, uh, you know, government systems um, and how they were also propping up and, and supporting these, um, you know, harsh policing and incarceration taxes that, that have been used against uh, Black and brown communities. And so, you know, throughout all of that, right, there was a lot of push to look at the general fund, but then always CARES Act was in the back of people's minds of like, how are these dollars being uh, utilized? And so we were obviously, you know, really keen on trying to figure out that information. But of course, throughout this whole process, one thing we've learned is that um, transparency hasn't always been there. And with that, obviously, community engagement hasn't been possible. So uh, we wanted to, you know, now that there's been more uh, information coming out, uh, largely due to the regulations and rules behind CARES Act, uh, now we're finally getting to see um, some indications of how these dollars were used. And so we wanted to be able to provide you all with information on what that, that role of the federal, the federal government played in providing uh, federal relief funding and local budgets, how that played out and, and either supported communities uh, or organ, uh, cities uh, during at this time, cities and counties. We then wanted to be able to provide advocates with an understanding of um, you know, how these federal funds uh, can meet the, the needs and strategic goals of organizing. Right, so a lot of folks have spent this year calling for more housing support, supports for uh, food, um, emergency shelter. So we wanted to at least get a, a look at, you know, how these funds have been used and how they can be used. And then really the last piece is, is then thinking about how do we apply what we learned this year to any future uh, federal relief package. Uh, but then also thinking as well as like, how do we connect um, any future one-time funds to ongoing organizing work, right? And, and funneling, it, funneling it into advocacy that's already been happening and will continue to happen. So it's not something that feels separate from your current work, but it feels aligned. So that if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, and so, yeah, some of the, the agendas that we, had, that we have for today is just doing a, a quick local budget outlook. Um, a lot of this is, is obviously connected to the, the city governments or county governments really passing um, budgets in, in June with a lot of uncertainty because of the economic uh, recession and, and, and really just like the, the ups and downs that we've seen this year. Um, a lot of that is connected to, you know, spending, right? So we wanted to bring that into the forefront a little bit, going uh, briefly into a CARES Act primer, um, just talk briefly about what the law was intended to do, and then share some case studies. And here, um, one thing as we, we pulled out data from multiple jurisdictions, was seeing that every jurisdiction did things a little bit differently. Um, so what we tried to do is at least uh, compare a few of them against each other. Uh, but again, knowing that, you know, 
what we have is, is only partial information. There's still going to be more information being released um, as the months go by. And so as that happens, we'll be updating our analysis as well. Um, from there, we'll, we'll touch on key themes and takeaways, and then uh, again, focus more on future, iteration, future iterations and next steps. Um, throughout each section, though, I would encourage you all to drop in questions in the chat, um, and we'll try to get to them after each section. So, uh, you know, I'll be monitoring that. But again, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, so from here, I'll just pass it over to Anisha, who will get us started on the local budget outcome. Thank you, Jackie. Next slide, please. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, so as uh, we've all experienced, COVID-19 sent local governments into a fiscal tailspin and brought years of relative economic growth in local revenues to a screeching halt. And this was primarily due to a bottoming out of some of the major revenue sources that local jurisdictions deeply depend on to balance their budgets, including sales taxes, hotels, occupancy fees, business taxes, as well as other fees for service. Um, and really the last six to eight months have been a period of um, you know, extraordinary uncertainty, right? Local governments have made budget decisions based on unclear revenue projections um, and adopted budgets based on these best guesses and often really worst case scenarios. And so that's why we want to encourage you to remember that these budgets that were adopted in the summer or the fall, they should be seen as placeholders. Um, based on recent data um, from our partners and in the localities that we work in, um, in almost every case, revenues have um, trended higher than expected. A lot of this is obviously due to the CARES Act funds, which allowed localities to backfill COVID-related spending um, and, that, and thus uh, reduce pressure on the general fund. So while it's important to remain cautiously optimistic about local revenues um, and how, how much is coming in, uh, really the severity of COVID-related impacts on local budgets can't be overstated. Uh, the timing, the depth of the fiscal crisis was more pronounced um, than what our state and local governments faced um, during the Great Recession. Uh, but in many cases, um, this, this year at least, localities had um, sometimes slightly higher reserves to work with and, and you know, drew from those reserves to be able to um, balance their budgets this past cycle. Um, in addition, we know that, you know, COVID has changed our world as we know it. We're still dealing with its impacts and the dev devastating toll that it's taken on our communities. Um, costs to provide ongoing COVID-related resources continue to increase every day. And we, uh, we know that CARES Act dollars, as we'll talk about later, uh, must be spent down by the end of the year. Um, finally, we'll, we'll speak to this too, um, the pro about the prospects of another round of federal stimulus, stimulus you know, it's currently up in the air. Next slide, please. So from an advocate standpoint, we wanted to share with you a couple considerations to keep in mind um, for those who are interested in local budget advocacy um, and, and really um, engaging with federal stimulus funds. When doing this type of work, it's typical that, you know, equity advocates are, are met with, you know, there's not enough money for this um, in response to demands for uh, critical community services and investments. But we want to break that down a little bit, um, too, especially in today's context. Uh, so like as was mentioned earlier, um, CARES Act served as a way to buffer, um, served as a buffer for cities and counties um, for having to make drastic cuts for this past budget cycle. So in LA County, for example, we heard um, how the federal stimulus dollars, one-time spending, and really pulling from reserves helped the county avoid layoffs for several hundred employees. Um, in some localities, um, CARES Act dollars served as an important source of emergency assistance for residents um, through housing and food supports. Um, but also, you know, many localities um, in the last year have taken a belt tightening approach to budgeting. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that revenue projections are always changing and there may be opportunities to avoid program cuts um, if revenues trend higher than expected. And then like as Jackie mentioned, due to the leadership of Movement for Black Lives and other groups, we've seen an extraordinary push for justice reinvestment um, and defund the police campaigns across the country 
that are attempting to win deeper investments in underfunded community services by interrupting the decades of overspending in uh, policing and incarceration. If you'd like to go deeper on you know, anything I just shared, um, I encourage you to check out the budget playbook resource that the, our team, the Equity and Community Investments team produced in the spring um, that helps advocates better understand how to do budget advocacy in COVID impacted localities. You could find it under advancement project ca.org slash COVID. Uh, next slide, please. And so now that you have a better picture of just how COVID continues to impact local budgets, I wanted to shift to, um, to the focus of today's presentation, which is how CARES Act play, plays a role in local budgets and can offer important lessons for federal, uh, future federal funding. So our team has really um, looked at how the federal and state governments have responded to the um, critical financial needs and healthcare costs of local jurisdictions. Um, the largest financial support thus far is, of course, the CARES Act in large part because it offered direct financial relief um, to certain jurisdictions of a certain size. Um, and in later sections, my colleagues are going to go deeper um, on the CARES Act and share case examples of how um, various local governments use their CARES Act dollars, how these places fared when it came to things like public access um, to these conversations, community participation, uh, transparency, and how the dollars were spent, and really, um, again, how to prepare for future rounds of federal funding to localities. Um, so that's it for this section, and I'll, I'll turn it over now to Jackie. Thank you, Anisha. Um, so if folks have other questions for Anisha regarding at least the, the, uh, the first section around the local budget outlook. And are in the chat. If not, then I think we can go on to the next slide where maybe I start to talk a little bit more about the CARES Act planner. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, we'll jump right in, folks, to um, give a preview of, of the CARES Act. We kind of want to provide everyone with the baseline uh, before we get into some of the local analysis. And there's some good information in here, so feel free to provide comments and, and questions as we, as we move along. And there will be a, a Q&A section uh, in the end of the section as well. So um, overall, uh, we're just going to cover the uh, basic parameters of, of revenue for uh, state and local agencies uh, via the CARES Act. Uh, the bill allocated a total of uh, $15.3 billion to cover costs through December, uh, which is the midpoint of fiscal year 2020, 2021. Uh, at the local level, uh, cities and counties with populations of at least 500,000 um, also received a, a portion of CARES Act funding. Um, direct allocations to California public agencies total to about $9.5 billion, uh, and the remaining $5.8 billion uh, was distributed to cities and counties. Um, these funds, um, in some ways, were not flexible um, as they were only required to be spent on uh, new expenditures uh, directly related to COVID. And so uh, jurisdictions in the state had to find a way to, to link expenses directly into new costs rather than trying to backfill uh, ongoing programming in funds. And so uh, the chart below sort of provides a, a breakdown of what total revenues were across the state. Uh, you will notice that uh, jurisdictions under 500,000 people uh, did not receive uh, resources, uh, but many um, counties in the state itself um, are working with local jurisdictions, the smaller ones, to provide them with uh, the appropriate resources to um, fill COVID-related expenses. Uh, in terms of the parameters, again, uh, like we mentioned, California received $9.5 billion, but it recognized that uh, many um, city and county agencies did not receive resources or did not receive enough resources, and it decided to distribute um, 1.2 billion of its 9.5 billion dollar allocations uh, to local jurisdictions. Uh, as a result, uh, total investments at the local level um, stood at about seven billion dollars. Uh, several jurisdictions have already tapped into their initial allocation from the federal government, um, and many are also tapping into uh, what was given to them uh, by the state. The timing was different everywhere, but uh, you know we do understand that um, every jurisdiction is trying to uh, balance and figure out how we can actually um, connect those dollars to the highest need resources. Uh, 
Now, I uh, just want to uh, provide a, a framework on some of the rules and parameters. Um, despite the financial relief they provide, um, CARES funds are restricted. Uh, so they do limit the capacity of cities and counties uh, to respond to changing community needs. Uh, because you know you only you can only identify new expenses. I mean, it makes it really hard to sort of forecast into the future. You know, what are some of the expenses communities will face today versus what they'll face uh, three months down the line. Uh, this has made the budgeting process a little more complicated uh, because uh, a lot of jurisdictions are fairly new to this pandemic-related planning um, and are trying to sort of figure out the best way to to balance the level of resources to the level of need. Um, again, like you mentioned, uh, CARES Act resources cannot be used to backfill revenue losses uh, due to the pandemic and are exclusively reserved to support uh, public agencies with uh, new costs. And uh, jurisdictions are required to spend down these funds by December 2020, which is the deadline uh, for the CARES Act. Uh, this constricted timeline has already impacted strategic thinking and engagement um, with communities around the budgeting process. What I do want to comment on with this December uh, 31st deadline is that realistically, we're probably looking at end of November, early December, because uh, most you know, local agencies kind of have their final meetings um, in that timeline uh, right before Christmas. And so the final decisions and votes should be happening then. And so advocates should really be planning now in the next uh, three to four weeks on how to actually you know, track those agendas and look at those issues, because waiting till the last you know, days of December um, you know, there, there probably won't be enough time and capacity to actually, um, you know, advocate for, for local dollars. Now, uh, we kind of want to provide folks a, a cheat sheet into some of the parameters and regulations. Um, there's been a lot of speculation and a lot of questions asked about what is and what isn't an expenditure. Uh, based off our analysis, we kind of uh, pulled together a list that can provide uh, policymakers and advocates um, a way to sort of understand, uh, you know, what are some eligible and ineligible expenditures. Um, on the left, we've got some eligible expenditures, which includes the obvious, including uh, COVID-19 testing, medical transportation, public hospitals, clinics, and facilities, quarantine expenses, social workers and public services, um, senior programs, food and distance learning, uh, and homeless and housing programs. So again, new expenses related to COVID-related uh, uh, needs. And then on the right side, we have um, ineligible expenditures. So uh, with the obvious ones, which are staff who are not involved with the uh, COVID-19 response at the local level, um, severance pay, legal settlements, damages covered by insurance, workforce bonuses, uh, regularly scheduled meeting, uh, sales tax shortfalls, and permit revenue shortfalls. Uh, the, the, the key point I want to emphasize here is this definition in a lot of ways is elastic because you may have um, a COVID-related expense in a library program. And so you're, that's just, you're providing distance learning through that new program. Defining distance learning, defining social services, senior services in the context of a new expense related to COVID looks different everywhere. So there's a level of uniformity that exists, but in terms of the actual baseline costs and the specifics, every jurisdiction has um, some flexibility in defining what that looks like. Uh, thank you, Asad. Um, there are a few questions that we've gotten already. One from Hovana. Um, can you explain more what you mean by cannot backfill revenue losses um, and maybe give an example of that? Sure. Uh, it, that's a great question. Um, when we look at uh, you know, cities and, and, and counties, a big part of their the revenue source is sales taxes, um, hotel taxes, fees, um, revenue from licenses. And so um, because of the economic shutdown, those revenues have declined. Uh, those revenues are important because they you know, fund core operating um, uh, programs such as parks, libraries, um, and, and, th and things like that. COVID, this, the CARES Act cannot replace the funding. And so the federal guidelines basically state that you know, the CARES Act isn't necessarily a relief bill to close any deficit you're creating. The main goal is to focus on new expenses related to the pandemic. So jurisdictions are in a situation where, you know, they are facing revenue declines in core programs that communities care about, like libraries and parks. But if they cannot find a connection to COVID itself or the pandemic, they can't use it to backfill revenue lost from, from the economic sensitive sources. So 
the CARES Act was only reserved specifically for new expenses. And so any ongoing programs that are being cut, it's going to be hard to use those dollars to prevent those programs from being cut. The issue really becomes, we all know the value of, of libraries and, and parks, um, programs that aren't necessarily connected directly to the pandemic, but do provide a real level of benefit for communities. And so a lot of folks are grappling with trying to figure out how do we actually, you know, uh, fill those costs in with some type of resources outside of theirs. Thank you, Saad. And, and do you mind, uh, as we answer some of these questions, if you can just leave it on the, the previous slide as well? Sure. Thank you. Um, another question that we uh, received um, is from Amy um, Saucer, a colleague, in terms of whether, you know, we've seen in some instances counties and even cities give uh, funds to nonprofits. Um, are, the, are those totals, um, you know, for, you know, grants to nonprofits also being counted for in the CARES Act funding? Of course, if they're related to CARES Act work. Sure, it's a, it's a great question. Um, yeah, we've seen examples of jurisdictions partnering directly with nonprofits um, to provide services to communities related to, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic response. Um, obviously, there's no specific parameters about the level of, of investment um, or the type of investment, um, but we have seen, um, you know, uh, priorities made in the areas of distance learning, um, children's services, housing programs, especially outreach to communities. And so when we get into the local section, we do have it, um, examples of jurisdictions um, partnering with nonprofit organizations uh, to really reach uh, high need communities. And those dollars do count uh, towards um, sort of the CARES related expenses. And so they do have to report those, that, those, those resources as well. Thank you. Um, there was also another question that we received um, in terms of, you know, does the 500,000 population relate to county size or city size? In both. Order to qualify? It, it, it applies to both. And so I think uh, the, the federal guidelines were just you know, lo stipulated local jurisdictions um, with at least 500,000 people. And so uh, I believe most, uh, most large counties um, and then a handful of, of, of sort of you know, mid-sized cities uh, receive those resources. Um, I will add that that was a a uh, a key question in the er in the early months of the of the bill, and I know several organizations uh, that represent you know cities and, and counties um, at the federal level um, did advocate and are continuing to advocate uh, to lower that threshold so that smaller jurisdictions, rural jurisdictions, also qualify for a possible next round of federal funding. Thank you. Um, and then uh, yeah, we got a lot of great questions here, and these are all extremely important questions as they are obviously related to what can be what these dollars can be used for so one of them as well is you know can these funds be used for supporting schools and district in distance learning um, so being able to provide direct grants to school districts yes so um the the cares act there's several components to the to the to the bill we're focusing on cities and counties um, but there was a component that focused on uh, K through 12 education, They're, the funds were more uh, flexible. And so uh, school district receives funds based on their proportion of um, Title I dollars. And so there was some equity induced at the, at the federal level. And a lot of local school districts, um, you know, are, have the capacity to spend the resources on whatever needs they, they, they see fit. And so um, right now, just, uh, school districts are in the process of in developing their, their budgets and LCAPs, which have now a, a deadline later at the end of the year. But a lot of school districts have those plans set. We, we have initial estimates for a few jurisdictions, but there'll probably be a follow-up that we will do looking deeply into school districts and how they spent the resources as well. But there is a separate pot of money separate from cities and counties uh, for school districts. What I will mention is that many cities and counties, although have partnered with school districts in different organizations to expand distance learning um, to really support the, the process as a whole when it comes to um, K-12 advocacy at this level. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions and then we'll go on to the next section because I do think um, we start to get into and hopefully answer some of the questions that have come through. Um, so another question is if you can pro or provide an example of uh, workforce bonuses. So I think the um, you know, I think in any organization, there are certain 
um, you know, promotions or, or folks might, you know, be eligible for certain, um, uh, I guess you can say uh, salary increases based on the collective bargaining agreement. That's what we mean by workforce bonuses. So just more of like, you know, ongoing costs that were going to happen because of some type of labor agreement. Um, you know, those those expenses cannot be charged to to CARES uh, to CARES Act dollars. Right. I think another example that we've seen as well is um, sometimes giving incentives for more um, like health workers to join the field um, to try to get more folks um, being able to you know to be um, either nurses or in the healthcare industry to provide support given the the level of need that we saw earlier in the year um, of folks you know going to hospitals and needing services. Um, the last question, um, and this is a great question, uh, is, you know, if any of the CARES Act funds can be used uh, for, you know, to, to provide support for individuals without legal status? I'm not sure if you saw that in any of your research as well. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I did not see any specific examples of that, um, mm -hmm. but I do know that a lot of jurisdictions um, have decided to uh, partner with organizations who provide programs and services um, to people um, who who are, who are in desperate need of, of the services. I, in terms of specifics, I, I I don't have any examples. But what we can do is write it down as a note, and I can, we can provide some more uh, research and detail into um, what your sectors are doing to address that issue as well. Yeah, yeah, and there there have been. In other instances as well where as I said, is, is alluding to that there have been grants given um, most recently I think we've seen here in LA County there is a grant to be going out to community-based organizations to do information around contact tracing um, you know COVID health information um, that's been happening but I think there's a, another separate layer to that is you know can those CBOs then you know provide direct funding for um, individuals um, whether for housing supports or um, you know, access to food uh, and food programs, uh, which there, there may be some wiggle room there, but I think that's a great question that we can follow up on. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go then to the next, um, you know, uh, section. Which I think there'll be even more interest. Um, again, uh, here we're doing a comparative analysis of what, you know, pulling out a few examples from localities. Um, and and I'll, let, I'll talk a little bit more about what you know what we found, um, and then of course we'll 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 have some time for questions after that. Great, thanks, Jackie. Um, so we'll we'll jump right into this section as well. Um, before we dive in and and provide examples of our research and some of our findings, we we want to give a overview of our methodology. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, um, every jurisdiction is uh, formatting their CARES Act strategy differently. Um, federal guidelines are, are rather flexible and so um, that does create a level of, of, of um, uncertainty because how information is reported and collected kind of looks different everywhere. But I kind of want to give uh, folks a, a, kick, a quick uh, preview of some of the methods we looked at, some of the processes that were involved. Um, overall, reporting for the CARES Act at the federal level falls into the purview of the Treasury Department. Um, the agency's inspector general is collecting financial information and will provide a holistic overview in 2020-2021. Uh, uh, if you go on the website, the first four months of spending um, have been reported. I believe the spending period was, um, was first opened up in, in September. And so, you know, there's going to be a, a sort of piecemeal process to, to collect the information. Uh, our analysis obviously wanted a more holistic view of, of the long-term um, forecasts and ideas that jurisdictions are thinking about when it comes to CARES Act spending. So we went through, um, you know, several um, legislative files um, tracking different you know, council meetings, county board meetings to get a better understanding of what are some of the ideas and thoughts behind CARES Act funding. What we will say is because there are multiple rounds of, of hearings, multiple rounds of, of estimates, um, our upcoming estimates are, are based on, you know, sort of what we were able to collect up into, you know, sort of September, October. Um, this doesn't mean that this is final. Um, there are some fund balances left over, and so we could see some shifts in the charts coming up. Um, this presentation focuses on the departmental and programmatic level. Uh, again, every jurisdiction, you know, sometimes they highlighted department responsible programs, sometimes they highlighted the programs uh, or the departments that are responsible as well. And so how we format the information uh, will look a little different, but we've tried our best to, to create a holistic approach so folks can get a, 
good idea of what some of the, the trends are out there. So we sort of wanted to uh, divide the presentation up into sort of levels of performance. And so we're gonna uh, jump into two examples, uh, the city of Los Angeles and Fresno City. Um, and we've sort of titled this area as, as moderate performance. Um, overall, uh, you know, our, our criteria really um, finds that these jurisdictions, so some level of, of strategic implementation, um, this includes um, factoring in issues such as geographic targeting, meeting a certain level of need, um, and or a focus on, uh, on high impact communities. Uh, what I wanna say is that this isn't necessarily the, the North Star model, but there is evidence of jurisdictions being a little more critical about how they target uh, CARES Act resources to the highest need communities, which ultimately um, advocates see as the goal. Uh, so overall, the city of Los Angeles received about um, $694 million in direct CARES Act funding from the federal government. Um, the state did not provide additional resources. And the, in Fresno City uh, received $92 million uh, in direct um, CARES Act revenue from the federal government. Um, it, it also did not receive um, allocations from the state. These numbers do seem, do seem fairly uh, uh, large and uh, there is a, a difference with them. Uh, the calculation for, for funding was based on the population and other factors at the federal level. So we will see uh, more resources in, in denser urban areas than in uh, rural areas. So we first want to highlight um, the city of Los Angeles. Um, overall, the city's, um, again, we, you know, we saw receive uh, uh, $694 million from the federal government. Um, the total spending plan is about $707 million. Again, it's still in the pipeline. Um, council is still working to uh, focus on how to spend some dollars down and, and make some adjustments as, as they move forward. Um, the largest focus uh, was on programs supporting um, housing uh, for homeless folks and um, rental relief. Um, you know, we highlighted this as a, as a uh, unique case study because we know the issues of housing that the region is facing. Um, the city has made a heavy investment um, into addressing those, those issues, uh, not just in terms of sheltering, but also programs and services available uh, for communities. Reimbursements for departments stood at about $145 million. Um, you'll see this trend often. Um, a lot of jurisdictions started incurring costs for COVID, you know, before the CARES Act was passed. And so the, essentially they're using CARES Act dollars to pay back um, different departments for programs that needed to provide. Um, in this case, it's about $145 million that were already spent by city agencies. Um, it's really important to track which agencies spent those dollars and whether they actually meet um, the parameters of the CARES Act. Obviously, like Jackie mentioned earlier, the focus should be on um, you know, housing, food assistance, uh, medical services, um, and really trying to move away from, from programs that uh, possibly suppress communities uh, through these expenses. Uh, the city uh, does have some unique programs involved. Um, they address two needs with a $10 million investment in um, children and youth learning at parks and recreation facilities. And so, you know, they do recognize the need that, that learning plays um, uh, in, in the future of young people. And so they do have um, partnerships at their specific parks and rec sites. Um, again, initial allocations total to about $551 million. Uh, what that really means is that $156 million was still being deliberated um, as the, uh, 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 when this uh, publication was, was prepared. And so the next couple of months, uh, we could see the council move forward to um, spend down the remaining $156 million um, based on our analysis, all indications show that housing really is going to be emphasis moving forward um, with the remaining funds as well. So again, it's, this is not a, a perfect model, but it, it does recognize um, you know, some of the needs that the city does have and the, the priorities and focus that, that, um, that policymakers are moving towards. The next um, moderate example we want to highlight is um, the city of Fresno. Uh, they did have a, um, a, a community engagement process throughout the last couple of months. Um, overall, the city received uh, about $90 million in, in CARES Act funding. Um, there is some equity, there's some evidence of equity with a, a $10 million proposal for clinics in, in high need areas. Um, the plan is still being deliberated um, in city council. A lot of our partners that we work with are trying to 
um, uh, push forward in terms of you know what implementation looks like, whether it's it's one time, whether it's ongoing, and so that's you know definitely an area that folks need to focus on. Again, these are all proposals, and so things could change till December. So it's important to uh, be imperative and, and keep track of the issues. Uh, the reserves stand at about thirteen million dollars, and so again, the city is about thirteen million dollars in in uh, CARES Act funding. It hasn't spent down yet, um, but there's a good chance that they will find. Um, areas that do need additional resources, and so it's, it's definitely good to, to track those. Looking ahead at Fresno, um, again, we you know, we do recognize that you know they are focusing on on high need areas, uh, but what we what we need to really uh, what advocates should focus on is to um, uh, track the agenda all the way through December. You know, make sure that the ten million dollar investment, I mean, health clinics uh, uh, is implemented, and uh, you know there is another focus on sort of directing um, contingency funds to the highest need areas. Um, what I will say with this is, uh, this is a good example of how CARES Act funding you know, can be used for high, high communities such as a health clinic, but it's one time. And so once a city uh, builds and develops these, these, um, these new facilities, uh, next year, they'll need to figure out how to sort of actually resource these programs. And so what's important here is that the CARES Act is one time, um, you know, capital expenditures, um, or you know, do have some flexibility and capacity in there, but jurisdictions should, should really focus on well, how do we resource these programs and services after CARES Act funds run out in December? But now we'll uh, jump into the um, second set of, of case studies, uh, which is uh, you know, what sort of highlight low performance. Um, again, our our definition um, really shows that. Um, some jurisdictions have limited evidence of strategic implementation. Um, this includes um, broad and opaque spending categories, abnormally high investments in the justice system, um, and or unclear linkages to high need communities. Uh, you'll notice here that these are two county examples. Um, counties are oftentimes uh, more complex uh, entities than, than cities. And so um, it, it has taken some, um, some bandwidth to figure out, well, what are some of the needs of the county and how they're addressing uh, those uh, those future costs. Um, Sacramento County overall has a direct allocation of about 180 million dollars through the CARES Act. Um, the state allocated 25 million for a total of 206 million dollars. San Bernardino County is our second example. Um, the direct allocation from the CARES Act is about 380 million. The state also kicked in about 50 million dollars for expenses for a total of 430 million dollars. So we're now going to go into um, you know, spending categories that were unclear and made it really hard for advocates to, to, um, to actually provide their voices into the room. So the first example is uh, Sacramento County. Uh, the budget of the CARES Act at about um, $193 million in total spending. They have about $13 million in, in unassigned costs. Um, it's a rather uh, broad plan with the largest component being jails at about $104 million, so 50% of funding. Um, the timeline and process here was delayed because um, as of a few weeks ago, they were still deliberating on how to spend down these dollars. A lot of jurisdictions are sort of in their second or third iteration. Um, this county is still trying to understand uh, some of the initial investments that were made in jail and what that actually means for the long-term future and health of, of county services that, that need CARES Act resources. What we do want to flag is that you know, jails are at high risk of COVID-19 outbreaks. Nonetheless, um, this county investment of 50% is, is rather high compared to its counterparts. Um, you know, we know the work that's been done the last couple of months when it comes to justice reinvestment. We understand the value that health agencies could play in terms of providing these services um, in a more holistic setting. Um, and so you know, the question really becomes whether this level of, of investment actually creates, um, actually creates a benefit for the counties themselves. Um, the initial framework itself created a barrier because you know we were unclear on the on the process itself when it came to the relationship between um, the county administrators and, and the board. Um, and so overall, it was difficult for advocates to provide a voice in the room, um, not just because of the heavy level of investment on the front end in the justice system, but there were some unclear metrics when it came to the process itself. And the last example we want to jump into is uh, San Bernardino County. So like we mentioned, a total spending plan of about $430 million. 
Um, so they budgeted about $312 million and um, $118 million is sort of, you know, proposed and spending. Um, the largest category um, is, uh, you know, previous costs and future costs at about $262 million, about 61% of the spending as a whole. Um, the county's initial proposal actually was, uh, was, was opaque. Um, they actually housed 88% of spending in a special fund uh, for the coronavirus relief. <clears throat> This allocation of, of you know, of, of 88% of costs under one giant special fund made it really hard for folks to understand and communicate um, some of the priorities of the counties. Um, advocates should really, looking at advocates should really uh, push ahead for more detail about the large blue category, uh, which basically covers previous costs and, and future costs through the end of the year. Uh, what I do want to flag, and I think we had a question earlier about this, about um, how cities, uh, how jurisdictions are supporting um, cities, counties, um, and, and school districts and nonprofits. Uh, as you can really see, the $118 million proposal, all that, you know, hypothetically would be going to, um, you know, local cities, uh, schools, fire agencies, private hospitals, and nonprofits um, for programs and services. And so this is an example of a county that, uh, you know, initially had unclear allocations but does provide input into how they're you know, sort of supporting their, their intergovernmental partners. Um, again, it, you know, advocates should take a look at this in terms of how future advocacy can be shaped uh, because when you have large and opaque spending categories, it makes it really hard for folks to communicate some of the issues uh, down the line. With that said, you know, we've have uh, the first set of, of moderate examples of transparency we have examples of jurisdictions that um, aren't necessarily transparent, uh, but we want to provide some, some equity-based highlights. And uh, what we mean by that is <clears throat> there are examples of, of jurisdictions identifying a certain level of need based on geography, based on, on race um, that they have targeted. And so we kind of want to uplift those programs, um, not just as models, but at, as models that could be potentially expanded uh, if there is a second round of federal funding, if there is a statewide um, a policy that increases revenue for jurisdictions. Uh, these are programs that we see uh, really benefit the communities. So the example, like I mentioned earlier, the city of Los Angeles, which has a, a children and youth learning program for about $10 million. Uh, the city of Fresno uh, has a proposal for health facilities in high need areas. Again, still being deliberated. Um, implementation is key through December, but that, that's also, uh, that also is resourced for about $10 million. Um, Los Angeles County, uh, working with the Office of Diversion and Reentry has six million dollars for the justice impacted community, specifically in the area of housing, and and we all know the impacts that that those communities are facing, not just um, in justice system facilities, but out in communities as well. The City of Sacramento has a homeless and detox program, uh, and that is a direct partnership with a with a nonprofit organization for about two point one million dollars. I mean, they also have a program with a handful of nonprofit organizations to focus on black children for about 1.2 million. Uh, and our last example uh, is uh, the city of Long Beach, which also has a, a program focusing on the health needs of black communities uh, through a nonprofit partnership for about $1 million. And that program is, is housed in its, its health agency and it's something that a lot of advocates out there are looking at in terms of an um, expansion when it comes to uh, future opportunities for equity in the future. So I want to close by providing um, a framework here. Uh, a lot of information has been communicated about um, good examples, bad examples, transparency, um, community engagement processes. But we kind of wanted to provide folks a framework of, of evidence that that you know that we see as a as a um, as a as a process. Um, it isn't the entire it's a solution, but we like to sort of provide this as a baseline. So when advocates do advocate for remaining CARES Act funds, future revenue, or revenue outside of the federal government, such as um, some of the ballot initiatives coming up, you know, what are some of the framework? What's some, what, what's some of the foundation that jurisdictions need to actually uh, build, out, um, build out some type of um, equity framework? So the first is um, open and transparent budget processes. Um, you know, we really did see uh, issues of transparency uh, when it came to not just having documents available, but access itself into CARES Act funding proposals. And so uh, real-time availability and easy access to CARES Act funding was definitely a, a big factor when it came to um, open government issues. Um, a lot of advocates were concerned with um, opportunities to inform funding. 
Um, I know there was a big issue when it came to virtual town halls, task forces, listening sessions, public hearings. It was really difficult to sort of provide a voice in the room when it came to advocacy beyond just policymakers and administrative staff. Um, and the last point on open government is uh, translation. You know, we all know the incredible diversity that that California has across the state. Um, and so, you know, ensuring those documents about CARES Act funding and priorities are, are available in all languages um, is key to creating a more holistic uh, community engagement platform across jurisdictions. And the last principle we want to focus on is matching resources to need. You know, we've seen examples of large entities um, that had you know, broad layers of funding, multiple layers of funding, um, but there are equity principles at the federal level that do provide um, a blueprint on how to actually distribute resources to the highest need communities. We have obviously community development block grants from, uh, the, from the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, Title I funds are induced with equity because they do focus on, on low-income students and emergency solutions grants, which focus on the needs of uh, housing insecure people. So there are examples of equity principles that can be applied. LCFF is also one of them. Um, and so, you know, if a new federal funding uh, policy is passed, um, there actually is a, is a blueprint that folks can follow to actually track and ensure resources meet um, the highest need communities. And the last uh, point we wanna close off on is uh, core services. Um, again, defining what core services are is very different um, across jurisdictions. We obviously understand the need to build up a framework internally when it comes to the health and safety of, of employees in cities and counties. At the same time, we do, you know, we do understand that the need for housing and rental assistance, health access, distance learning, food assistance um, should also be priorities uh, throughout this um, equity framework for, for federal funding. So we're now going to transition over to my, my colleague, Jackie, who will synthesize the information um, that I mentioned earlier through themes and key takeaways. There is a Q&A section after this, and so feel free to continue um, asking your questions and we'll move forward from there. Thank you, Asad. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of, you know, what are some of the themes and key takeaways? Um, you know, there was a lot of really good information that Asad shared. I think that the thing here, again, to lift up is, is a comparative analysis. So when we compared some jurisdictions with the others that we were able to dig out information for, um, you know, what were, were again, the, the differences that we saw. Um, but before we kind of go into some of those takeaways, I think, you know, one of the, the major things that we saw is, uh, again, the, the lack of, you know, you know, process and spending transparency. So again, um, there were many, many issues as we did this earlier, um, you know, as we worked on this earlier in the year, just really understanding um, how, you know, tracking these dollars um, throughout the, the year. Uh, a lot of those spending decisions, again, were done behind doors um, within, uh, you know, the, the, you know, city manager's office, uh, city county executive offices with department directors and, and uh, elected officials. Um, so that obviously made it difficult to track dollars and also to engage community um, as these things, these decisions were being made. Um, the other real factor is that outside timeline, right? There was a deadline by which these dollars needed to be spent. Um, and so then, uh, you know, these agencies wanted to, uh, you know, move this process quickly so that that way um, they could get the dollars out. Um, but in doing so, obviously, there would be missed opportunities um, for, for partnerships with community organizations and, you know, broader strategic thinking about how, what's the best use of these funds. Um, and so when you obviously look at those different pie charts, you see um, that there's just so many different approaches that they took. And, and some of that just had to do with, you know, again, who, was, who, who within government was more prepared to be able to seize the opportunity to obtain those funds um, and then, you know, if there was uh, some programs, pilot programs that could be launched, then of course they would try to do that. Um, but again, uh, you know, the transparency is, is, is a real issue and really did carry forward even until now, where as I saw shared, these are just some initial looks that we've seen. Um, there's constantly updates happening, uh, but it's hard to really paint that clear picture um, because sometimes it's, it's difficult to track these updates as they're made. Um, then, you know, again, underlying, um, you know, the limited to non-existent community engagement process um, that happened, uh, you know, 
it was very limited in terms of you know what the outreach in some cases was from elected officials to community. Um, in, in places like LA County, there was task force developed to try to engage with uh, public health departments, but in other localities, that may, that may not have happened. Um, then, you know, again, the, there was also uh, difficulties when it comes to community organizing bandwidth, right? Um, as, you know, uh, as governments are adjusting and not sure what the revenue outlook was going to be for fiscal year 21, uh, you know, there was also additional needs to move money out to be able to do contact tracing, to be able to support local health agencies. Uh, at the same time, there was also efforts, right, to, to really see shifts outside of the general fund um, for, away from policing and incarceration into upstream investments in health services and, you know, parks, recreation. And so all that was happening roughly around the same time. Um, so of course, for advocates, it was difficult to do some of this organizing around CARES um, be alone because there was just, again, these, these larger themes around uh, policing and incarceration, the need to really uh, re, you know, rethink our uh, you know, local priorities and make sure that the, the money, ongoing money was being funneled on an ongoing basis for uh, services in, in communities of color. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the other, the other major themes that we saw were again these unspent balances. Um, you know, local governments, you know, uh, because they had to make some decisions uh, happening pretty quickly. Um, you know, they may have put some money aside uh, to determine if there was going to be, um, you know, the federal government was going to change some of their policies and guidelines in terms of, you know, how when these dollars need to be spent by. Um, you know, again, also it was, uh, you know, some of these balances were set aside because they they're, they're weren't sure what the costs were going to be throughout the year. Um, but again, uh, you know, one thing we've learned, at least from some of our initial conversations with, um, you know, elected officials is also, you know, they, they, they're holding the money there. They already have a sense of how those dollars are going to go out. And so uh, for them, it's more so, um, you know, already programmed, but they're just in that holding facility. Um, so again, you know, for like where that leaves advocates now, it, it is really, um, you know, seeing what these public documents are saying, but following up with, uh, you know, your allies in government um, to get a sense of what the real unspent balance is. And if there's ways to get those dollars out um, in November and December before uh, the end of the year. Uh, again, um, you know, if you factor in holidays, um, that does eliminate, uh, you know, more days and, and time and availability. Um, so there it's really, um, you know, if there are unspent balances, making sure that, that y'all are getting in front of them with, you know, proposals that are, are, are thought out um, so that that way they can be moved out. Um, then for the proposals that have already been put forth, I think, you know, of course that Fresno City example is a great one of the $10 million is, is really a more so on implementation at that point. It's, um, you know, it's, it was put in a plan. Um, now let's make sure it happens and it, and it carries through. Um, so whether it's something you've already been putting in the works, it's making sure that it gets implemented and seen through uh, throughout the end of the year. Um, then, you know, I think there was another interesting dynamic that, that we were able to identify, and that was, again, the difference between, uh, you know, how to advocate and do, uh, you know, budget advocacy for these dollars at the city versus county level. Um, the thing is, at the city level, you know, we saw there was a little bit more creativity at times with how these dollars were spent. Um, and, and some of that had to do with, you know, the accessibility of these uh, of elected officials at the city level um, and even the sizes of these departments, um, you know, mainly being that they're not as big as at the county level. Um, you know, then in contrast, you know, counties, they do offer more um, health supports, housing supports, they do have more of a health arm, um, but they're also much larger. Um, these departments, these agencies, and they're more decision makers in the process. So that makes um, you know, organize at that level a little bit more challenging. Uh, also, the level of transparency isn't always there uh, within some of these departments. So, you know, I think the takeaway here is, you know, having those relationships are really critical um, to leverage them in these moments where there are quick decision making happening. Um, the, the other thing we, we definitely don't want to lose track of is, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the reason why we may see some creativity in some of these like examples of, of programs and services um, is because of the budget advocacy that organizers did on the ground, um, you know, really lifting up the need to invest in health, lifting up the need to invest in, in black communities, brown communities, lifting up those issues throughout the year, 
Um, again, really, we can see it uh, in some of these documents. And so um, definitely want to want to acknowledge that um, and, and again, encourage that continuing relationship and continuing organizing and advocacy into next year. You can go to the next slide. Right, so I will pause here actually for questions. I know there were some that, that have come up um, uh, from the top of the section. Um, so I think we were able to get to Deep's um, question around, you know, uh, compile some innovative CARES Act expenditures. Um, we provided some there um, and, and, you know, as we start to collect and continue to collect more information, I think we'll be able to share some of those out as we do. Um, you know, I think another question came in from Hovana around, uh, you know, if, uh, if CARES Act funds uh, can, you know, if there's a limit to how much of these dollars can be spent on business grants or to help businesses. I think the answer to that is not really, um, you know, we've seen uh, some large, you know, expenditures being made um, and, and small. I think really the, the, the local governments have been given flexibility in terms of um, what they think is COVID related expenditures. And so um, that has given them the ability to determine uh, the sizes of, of the grants that they, they, they give out. Um, I think another question um, from Clarissa is, you know, uh, we're seeing uh, localities spend funding on cops and firefighters saying that they're essential for COVID response. Um, but again, it's just paying for salaries and benefits under existing contracts of their union contract. Is this okay? Um, you know, is that allowable? Uh, Asad, do you, do you have uh, some thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, great question. Uh, you know, we have seen examples of that. Um, and like we mentioned earlier, every jurisdiction has flexibility to sort of define uh, code-related expenses. And so oftentimes we do see um, firefighters um, and policing be designated as um, first responders or be designated as uh, folks who are part of the health apparatus in terms of providing um, services. Uh, that There is a fine balance there because we do understand that there are um, higher impact investments that could be made. Um, so there's no specific uh, limitation, but what we have seen is where advocates are um, keen and provide their voice into defining what a core service is. Um, you know, we see uh, uh, less investments in sort of the justice system. So it's just a matter of figuring out how do we actually uh, work in partnership with policymakers to really give them a, a foundation and baseline into what the true definition of, of core community services are. You know, for example, like you mentioned earlier, um, housing, access to health programs, transportation, uh, areas like that. And so uh, that that is a question that I think all jurisdictions are grappling with and they will continue to grapple with as they um, spend down this first round of funding and prepare for the next one. And so it's really good to, to codify some of the, the goals of the approach and, and provide the definition for folks. Yeah, thank you. I think the other thing I'll add to that as well is I think that when we went into doing and starting to pull some of the the you know, um, CARES Act spending for various jurisdictions. Um, you know, I think I, I had a concern in terms of uh, how much of this was being used to um, pay for and like um, to cover like the back end operations, right, of, of different agencies. And it was, it was kind of a mixed bag. I think that, um, you know, if, if we tried to add it up across the board, we may see that a good chunk of the dollars went to pay for, um, you know, uh, Folks within government already doing some work, right? And then they just added on top of that this this like additional responsibility around um, COVID. Um, and so, so you know, I think that 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 is a, a really good and valid concern. I think that's why getting in early, you know, if there's ever a next round, um, and and again, of course, you know, there's always going to be those issues around transparency that we need to call for and, and improve. Um, is to make sure that a, a, you know funds are set aside for money to go out into community versus it staying within the general government apparatus, because um, then that way it just goes into backfill um, the the cost, salary costs, and other one-time costs that that uh, local government have. Um, they still may make a case that they need additional funding for that, right? But again, uh, we're constantly pushing to make sure the money goes out into community. Um, and it goes to community-based organizations, goes to health centers, uh, where then it could be felt more directly by individuals, um, by the community members that need them. Um, another question, um, and I think these are somewhat related, is in terms of, you know, can these CARES Act dollars be used for infrastructure 
um, spending and, and innovation. So I think we had an individual who offered up, you know, can these dollars be connected to municipal broadband? Um, I think there's a case there potentially be made around, um, uh, you know, uh, distance learning for students. And then, you know, another question came in in terms of, you know, do these dollars need to be spent by the 31st or do they just need to be budgeted and programmed in? But obviously spending, especially if, if we're talking about infrastructure here, you know, you, an agency may not be able to complete a building or complete um, like a broadband, uh, you know, network or whatnot within uh, two to three months. So is there a possibility for these dollars to be programmed in, but then spent throughout the rest of the fiscal year? Um, Saad, I don't know if you came across some of that in some of the policies and guidelines around these dollars. I, I have. And so um, from what I understand, they have to be budgeted, but not necessarily spent down. Um, I think there is going to be a certain uh, a scope and timeline when it comes to um, capital projects, but reporting started in September. And so um, there, the resources are budgeted, but uh, jurisdictions would have to follow up in terms of those reporting guidelines, um, because um, I don't think they'll be in compliant if they budget for, let's just say, a COVID-related expense uh, within a for distance learning, but if they reprogram those funds for something else and outside of the scope of the CARES Act resources, they essentially would have to either pay those resources back or figure out a way to sort of uh, pay for those dollars out of their general fund. And so um, there is a, an issue of timing because the official deadline you can see for budgeting is December 31st. Um, a lot of folks will make decisions by late November, early December, uh, but the actual implementation plan will probably go into uh, 2021 uh, just given the fact that it takes time to spend down um, such high fund balances. Yeah, and so I think one thing we can do after this um, presentation is in that in that follow up, you know, we can identify the clauses within the CARES Act um, uh, legislation if there is information around that, just so that that way advocates can have that for their ongoing, um, you know, communications with folks within government. Thank you. Um, Okay, so let's go to the last section and then from there we'll be able to get to the last few questions that have come through. Great, uh, thanks Jackie. Uh, we're now uh, gonna close out this presentation uh, by providing folks a, a baseline for future iterations of, of federal funding and uh, possible next steps for advocacy and, and some direction when it comes to how folks can prepare for, for resources within their communities. So, like we mentioned, um, you know, the CARES Act was a, a large investment, uh, about $15.3 billion for the state and uh, local governments across, across, um, across California. Um, there are some underutilized CARES Act funding funds that remain. Um, the first one I do wanna flag is the Municipal Liquidity Facility, uh, which is a, a fancy way of saying uh, loans from the federal government for local agencies to manage cash flow. Uh, this is different from the initial uh, review that we just provided you all through the Treasury Department. Those are resources that do not have to be paid back, but there is a, a federal a, a borrowing aspect uh, under the CARES Act in which local governments have access to loans. Uh, they can use it to backfill um, cash flow issues, but eventually those resources would have to be paid back with interest uh, to, the, to the Federal Reserve. Um, the scope is more flexible. About 250,000 uh, people is the minimum population uh, threshold. Uh, it, the December 2020 deadline also applies and the funds are unique in that they're unrestricted. And so these are resources that can be used to backfill um, programs that could be cut that don't qualify for, for uh, CARES Act resources. Example would be you know, keeping the, the library open during weekend hours, um, park facilities um, at nighttime for, for folks. And so uh, it does provide a level of flexibility that the initial um, uh, uh, CARES Act funding does not, has not provided. For California, the state is eligible for a, a maximum loan of about $40 billion, um, and cities and counties uh, combined are eligible for a loan of about um, $14 billion. Uh, while we were doing our research, we did not find uh, many jurisdictions that are um, talking about uh, these resources. Um, I think one of the many reasons is that um, it is a loan. Uh, it would have to be paid back with interest, and so, uh, because of the cash flow issues that folks are going to be facing due to declining general fund expenses, um, this level of borrowing is seen as, as a high-risk proposal. Uh, but it is something that folks should track because we do still have two months until the deadline, um, and uh, we would not be surprised if 
a future iteration of federal funding does have some type of, uh, of, of, of loan process attached to it as well. So it's a, good, it's a good parameter to understand what's on the table and what could move forward um, in, the, in, the, in the case of a new proposal. Um, the second point on uh, uh, CARES Act is uh, residual funds. And so, uh, like we showed in the charts before, a lot of jurisdictions have um, fund balances when it comes to CARES Act funding. Um, some have made initial proposals on what they want to do. Some are uh, titling them as emergency funds where they'll tap into them if they need to research other programs. Um, but they do need to be spent down by December um, and are likely spoken for already. And so right now, um, different uh, local agencies are trying to figure out not just how to spend down what they budgeted, but any reserve funds that are left over from the original CARES Act allocation are also being debated. So the question really becomes, you know, strategically, what makes the best sense in terms of um, advocating for remaining dollars um, around the CARES Act? The next point we want to make um, is um, the, the, the idea of a future federal funding package. Now, um, a lot has been speculated and debated about what that could look like. Um, there is a plan that was approved out of the House of Representatives, um, commonly known as the HEROES Act. Um, different versions are being debated right now in the Senate. Um, there are multiple proposals, um, even as of this last week. Uh, you know, we're not going to get into the details of this, but we do want to provide folks a baseline into um, some of the possibilities of a second uh, CARES Act proposal. So the HEROES Act is, is very similar uh, to the first uh, to the first CARES Act proposal, um, except it just you know, provides more resources for local agencies and it's also flexible funding. And so um, you know, jurisdictions do have um, discretion over how do we actually spend those dollars down beyond just immediate CARES Act needs, but some long-term planning can be done as well. Um, and, and we see this as an, as an important um, factor uh, because uh, shifts could happen starting, starting in January, depending on what happens after the elections. And so um, if, if not the HEROES Act, there, there is a likelihood that a similar bill with similar framework around resources for local governments um, could be pushed through um, from, from federal agencies and onto local governments. And so it's good to just kind of have a, a framework of what that could look like. Um, so for the HEROES Act um, in 2020, the state uh, um, hypothetically has uh, $21 billion of, of resources. Um, cities and counties have about $30 billion um, for 2021. Uh, we've, the state has about $26 billion apportioned for, for, um, for federal relief, from federal relief, and cities and counties have about $15 billion. So in total, um, the state and county have about $45 billion um, readily available um, through the HEROES Act. Um, again, this, is, uh, this should be viewed as a contingency because uh, whatever plan does come out, it will follow some type of framework and metrics for the actual HEROES Act. And so you know, taking the lessons learned of, you know, of the, of the CARES Act the last couple of months, it's good to know what is available. It's good to know, um, you know what resources um, uh, can be used and what communities can benefit. We do have details on every county and every city and, and what that could look like. And so if you, do, if you all do have questions about, well, let me get a head start into uh, a possible future federal funding package, uh, you can communicate with us and we can provide you information from there. And we want to close out um, by providing um, some, some uh, foundation into the next steps for advocacy. Um, there's a lot going to take place in the next couple of weeks, but we kind of just want to provide some perspective on, on what we've learned from advocates and, and what some of our research has also um, uh, uh, communicated to us in terms of what we can do to be more strategic in the future. Um, you know, the first one is really for advocates to uh, define their goals and create alliances. Um, as we saw uh, from the lessons of, of the CARES Act implementation, uh, you know, it's good to be uh, ready to present the most pressing community needs to local agencies, um, the way localities should respond, um, and which essential services are necessary to meet the need. Um, and as you provided earlier, there are some examples of programs that could be maintained, programs that could be expanded, um, perhaps other examples in jurisdictions that folks folks see could be modeled in, in their communities as well. It's good to have that information um, solidified um, and crystallized in advocacy circles. What I will mention is that, you know, uh, topics such as distance learning, health access, uh, medical services, you know, those are all, um, you know, they have many overlaps, but they're also in a lot of ways um, unique 
in terms of the type of advocacy that's required. So it's good to crystallize what are the top two or three um, goals for your coalition so that when it comes to communicating uh, the message about future, future funding, it's easier to, to connect with folks to, 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 to sort of implement the policies that, that we see fit for our communities. Um, the second point under that is that policymakers move quickly. You know, we've seen that in the last couple of months, not just with, you know, the level of uh, budgets that were approved in June, um, but, you know, CARES Act funding and multiple iterations. You know, we've already seen follow-ups to June approvals. We've seen multiple follow-ups to initial CARES Act um, planning. And so it's good to be proactive and build the relationships today with your county and city representatives to get a better understanding of how can we uh, find overlaps and, and educate each other about uh, some of the priorities uh, that, that communities need to see. And uh, the second point on that is coalition alignment. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there's a very large nonprofit infrastructure that exists in California communities. Um, you know, you're all going through the same door when it comes to City Hall or the County Board of Supervisors. Um, it's good to sort of uh, consolidate some of the ideas uh, to actually create more of a more of a presence within those buildings uh, to to uh, impact advocacy um, in the in the direction of equity. Uh, and the, the last point I do want to point out is um, aligning organizational capacity. Again, uh, it's good to look ahead and identify opportunities for other revenue initiatives that can provide more funding options that align with community demands. Um, what I will flag is that you know, whether it's the CARES Act or HEROES Act, this is one-time funding. This is funding that makes sense for uh, maybe you know, two to three years of planning, but it should not be necessarily viewed as a, as a long-term plan because eventually jurisdictions will have to figure out a way to pay for those resources. And so uh, we do have a, a heavy uh, 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 ballot uh, in November. Uh, there's a lot of revenue uh, that could be decided upon. And so it's good to sort of figure out, well, what are some opportunities for us to link and connect resources uh, to our community demands so that there is a long-term planning and approach uh, that could be made? It doesn't mean you know, move necessarily away, but you know, the way I see it is federal funds can be used as a Kickstarter and then um, ongoing revenue can be used for sustainability. Um, and the last point um, that we sort of want to, to, to close out on is to start, to start early. And so um, whether it comes to implementation for future federal revenue, uh, revenue from ballot initiatives, um, you know, advocacy starts tomorrow. And so the best way to sort of, you know, codify that is to really sit down and work with your partners to figure out um, which federal, statewide, and local goals make the most sense, and how do we actually benchmark those goals with uh, future revenue opportunities for our communities. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jackie now, who will provide us with some feedback on, on future AP products, and then we'll have also a Q&A session as well. Right. Um, thank you, Saad. So I think uh, before we close out, I just wanted to lift up a uh, recent uh, policy brief that our, our colleagues um, with uh, Political Voice uh, within the Advancement Project just released uh, earlier this week. Um, again, lifting up um, how participatory budgeting can really advance racial um, equity in California through the budgeting process. Um, so again, it, they provide a framework and understanding for how participatory budgeting can be done through a racial equity lens, uh, you know, opportunities to organize and advocate for communities and then offer recommendations and, and how, again, um, participatory budgeting can uh, combat systems of racism and empower marginalized communities. So just wanted to lift that up. If you haven't seen it, we'll drop it in the chat. Um, so if you don't mind going back a little bit, um, yeah, or there you go, forward, excuse me. Um, I think we have some for remaining questions. I wanted to make sure that, you know, we, again, want to loop back with folks regarding um, that, that, you know, uh, deadline of December 31st for when dollars need to be expended. Um, I was doing some side research as, uh, we're, you know, this webinar is going, and, and I think, you know, there is, some indication that uh, they need to be incurred this year, but again, the way that the payment is paid out obviously may connect into FY21 or later in, in the fiscal year into January and on. Um, so we'll definitely want to loop back with folks um, to whether, you know, whether that is the case that that is allowable. And again, um, do those policies also apply to uh, local, you know, community-based organizations um, who receive funds as well um, from those local agencies? Um, do they get the same kind of uh, reporting requirements that uh, the federal government gets? Um, 
Let's see, another question that we've received. Um, let's see. Um, right, so I think that also gets us to see his next question. Um, you know, are there any information so that, you, that you found in your research on how funds are impacting programs uh, that serve women versus men? Any based on gender? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I did not see um, any specific details, uh, but what I do know is that, um, you know, uh, health agencies within counties do have um, specific initiatives for, for men and women, um, you know, what we can do is, um, you know, collect some of these questions and uh, uh, dig in some more, find more research on the specific investments that are made um, within those initiatives. And so uh, those do exist. You know, those are in a lot of ways eligible for, uh, for COVID-related um, expenses. And we can circle back on, on the specific jurisdictions who are addressing um, um, that issue. Uh, then one of the last questions we received was, um, you know, if I think maybe it's good to to reiterate again, you know, how CARES Act dollars can be spent um, or, or, you know, related to COVID, if they um, are just limited to direct services or if they can uh, go for or pay for operations and infrastructure as well to be able to respond to the, the pandemic. Yeah, uh, both. And so, um, like, like Jackie mentioned earlier, um, you know, there is this question about um, how to get resources into communities, uh, whether it's through a department or through a nonprofit organization. But there is also a, a back end operational cost related to that because you do have folks who are administering the grants, folks who are uh, sort of moving the, the uh, internal controls uh, within you know, city and county agencies forward. And so uh, we've seen, again, uh, a mix, you know, where you could have hypothetically, um, you know, the auditor controls office involved because they do. Um, um, sort of manage some of the, the revenue and expenditures within a county at the same time. You could have outreach workers um, through the health agency or nonprofit organization also be resourced through to the CARES Act. In terms of how the dollars are split, um, we haven't seen a, a clean cut and if we don't have a, an answer right now about what's the best practice and, and what type of proportionality makes the best sense. Uh, but what we can do is once more information is available, uh, we can get a look at, well, how much actually went through uh, communities through nonprofit organizations versus how much was housed in departments. And so uh, we can definitely provide that more information once we get clarity on, on final spending plans closer to December. Thank you. So I think we, we got through um, all the questions. I just want to thank everybody um, for joining us today um, and for asking great questions and important questions. We'll be sure to um, you know, send this recording out. There is, uh, I know several individuals who weren't able to join us. Um, so we'll make sure to get that web, the, the recording out as well as get to some of those questions that are lingering um, with more information um, that folks can access so that they can use it for their advocacy purposes. Um, but again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you and your time um, and have a wonderful day.